It's this thing on. Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. I'm very welcome, my friends, and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. And welcome to Sunday's edition of the DC Movie and TV Daily. And we're all about the Joker at the moment. Of course we are. It's the biggest event, film event of all freaking time. It's amazing and it's extremely exciting for this DC fan. And I'm sure all of you who have got any little bit of sanity left in your heads, because how can you hate on this movie? Freaking amazing. So I'm going to read out a variety of articles, pretty much kind of briefing up what the critics are saying. And then I'm going to define the Joker movie for you. And to tell you something quite controversial that I believe is true from my very point of view. And then I will finish off by comparing uh, the Joker movie to Batman v Superman. And I, I'm going to make a very, very serious point about that comparison. But first of all, let's read this Variety article. Don't forget, I'm at, mo at Movies TV Mad on Twitter. Please go on there and give me a follow so we can continue the conversation I don't just follow back anyone. If you interest me and I'm interested in what you've got to say, I will follow you back. Plus, if you if I want to have sex with you, I'll also follow you back. Should we read this variety article now? Joker reviews what the critics are saying. Critics are raving for Warner Brothers' latest comic book instalment. Todd Phillips' Joker opens Saturday at the Venice Film Festival. The effervescent reviews with many critics highlighting an Oscar-worthy appearance from star Joaquin Phoenix. Variety's own Owen Glebron praised Phoenix's performance, empathising his physical acting and emotional control. He appears to have lo lost weight for the role so that his ribs and shoulder blades protrude and the leanness burning his face down to its expressive essence. Black eyebrows, shallow cheeks sunk in gloom. A mouth so rubbery it seems to be sm smarking at the very notion of expression. All set off by greasy mop hair of hair, he wrote. Phoenix is playing a geek with an unhinged mind, yet he's so controlled that he's mesmerising. He says true to the dis desperate logic of Arthur's... He stays true to the desperate logic of Arthur's unhappiness. Variety's Owen Gleedman. Many have asked, and with good reason, do we need another Joker movie? Hang on. We've never had a Joker movie before. We've had Joker in Batman movies, so let's get that straight first off before I continue reading this. Yet what we do need badly are comic book films that have a very gravitas, that unfold in the real world, so that there's something more dramatic at stake than whether the film in question is going to rack up a billion and a half dollars worldwide. Joker manages the nimble feat of telling the Joker's origin story as if it were unprecedented. We feel a tingle when Bruce Wayne comes into the picture. He's there less as a false than an omen, and we feel a deeply deranged thrill when Arthur, having come out of the other side of his rage, emerges wearing smeary makeup, green hair, and orange vest, and an, a, a, a rust coloured suit. Cool, this is very spoilery, isn't it? Hope you don't mind. Empire Online, Terry White. It's a sad, chaotic, slow burn study of someone who isn't visible, who doesn't even exist to the world around them. But your empathy, sympathy, even isn't guaranteed. And it begins to dissolve as Arthur somehow moves even further to the edges. This is, this is we mustn't forget the story of how a villain was made. But what writer-director Todd Phillips and co-writer Scott Silver, 8 Mile, the fighter, have written into life is the Joker as a character. What they and the film is interested in is the mental, more emotional, physical makeup of the man who became the Joker. IndieWire's David Eric, Todd Phillips, Joker, is unquestionably the boldest reinvention of superhero cinema since The Dark Knight, a true original that's sure to be remembered as one of the most transgressive studio blockbusters of the 21st century. It's also a toxic rallying cry for self-pitying insults and hyper-familiar origin stories so indebted to Taxi Driver and the King of Comedy. The Martin Scorsese probably deserves an executive producer credit possessed by the kind of proactive spirit that's 
uh, seldom found in any sort of mainstream entertainment, but also directed by a glorified edgelord who lacks the discipline or nuance to responsibly uh, handle such hazardous material and who reliably takes the cow's way out of the narrative's most critical moments. I told you, right, before I before I start reading on, and we've got Jim Vajvoda from IGN, that should be interesting, right? Very mainstream, very uh, Disney biased, but uh, we'll read him in a minute. Um, I told you, basically, what you read there were the opinions of an SJW, a social justice warrior, because they don't get it. They don't get it. They don't want to get it. This is a film. This is a film about the Joker, about really the logical way how someone will become the Joker. But it's so much more than that, because it shows you the parallels of someone with true mental health problems. But men are not allowed to have mental health problems. No. We must just represent other societies, other um, genders. Well, there's only other one. Other. Well, actually there's, actually, there's loads of genders now, apparently, isn't there? But the point is, the point is, these people don't like these films because this represents a lonely man who is suffering. And lonely men are actually something for celebrities on the Internet to laugh at and mock. How many times have you been on the Internet and you get these silly so-called beautiful girls mocking men in their 40s. Men like Arthur. And is it any wonder what happens to Arthur in this film? How many times can a person be kicked until they kick back? And I'm going to talk more about that later on. This Gotham is a place of a grimy despair, extreme wealthy disparity and festering lawlessness, teetering on the brink of collapse. While this realistic depiction makes a place that's typically fantastical seem familiar, it's not just the recognisable setting that gives Joker its hyper-realism. It's what it's allegorically about that makes the movie so believable, timely and worth talking about long after the credits roll. Joker is a period piece, but it's undeniably about our own troubled, relentless, violent time. Yes, Jim, I totally agree. Phoenix absolutely transforms himself as Arthur Fleck. The physical moment of the character alone could convey what is going on with him. Even if there had been no dialogue, he's awkward and twisted, particularly his arms and his position of his head when he's trying to be normal. The little dances he does as he tries to act sexy or confident are the sort that make you embarrassed for someone at a party. As he becomes who he really is, the movements are powerful. The movie is, for a good stretch, a troubling and an arresting character study, one done with nervy conviction. Eventually, though, Phillips has uh, to more tightly attach this down, downward spiral of the larger Gotham mythology, which is where the proactive um, ambivalence of the film gives way to veneration. veneration. The climax is a gnarly triumph for the man who has now turned into the Joker, a baptism of blood and fire, which brings to mind the political protest that has swept the world this decade and the far more discreet and noble incident of Christine Chuckbuck's death. There's some Bernie Kerrick in there too. Collider Steve Weintraub. Oh, this will be interesting, Collider, because they've always been so nice to DC in the past, haven't they? If you're going into Todd Phillips' Joker movie expecting to see a number of costume heroes joking around between massive action set pieces, you need to adjust your setting. That's because uh, Phillips has crafted an intimate standalone character study that's extremely influenced by another era of filmmaking from the way the opening credits play to the final frames of the movie. Phillips has taken the colourful comic book movie to the dirty, gritty streets of the late 1970s with fantastic results. Trust me. You have never seen a comic book movie like Joker, and I'm not sure we will ever get one like this again. Which is a shame. Time Stephanie Zachra. The movie's cracks, and it's practically or, or, or practically all cracks, are stuffed with po phony philosophy. It, 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 here we go. Uh, Joker is a dark, dark only in the stup uh, stupidly adolescent way, but it wants us to think it's imparting subtle political or cultural wisdom. Just before one of his more violent tirades, Arthur muses everybody, just screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore. Who doesn't feel that way in our terrible modern times? But Arthur's observation is one of those truisms that's so true it just slides off a wall and message that both the left 
and the right can get behind and use for their own names. It means nothing. No, Stephanie, what means nothing is you. You, yes, are a female critic who clearly don't like this film for your own political, insane reasons, and you will say anything to smear it. But as I've said to a lot of you critics already, this film is bulletproof. Shall I tell you why this film is bulletproof? Not only because of its quality, because who's powering this film secretly at Warner Brothers? There is a big influence here. This film was always going to be a success, one way or another, and you can't touch this. This is truly a unique moment in cinema, and people like you are going to have to cry those bitter tears and suck it up, because there's nothing you can do about it. Because you've never been a man before, Stephanie. You don't know what it's like to be lonely and in your 40s. You don't care what it's like to be lonely and in your 40s or your 50s or whatever after is in this film, right? You'll never know. Women like you think it's a laughing matter. You think the world's just about female issues. There's so many more of us suffering out there. And people like yourself, Stephanie, don't care. Should we move on? So basically, yeah, that's everything on here. Uh, shame that negative review was the last one I read. So the other day, right, someone asked me to define the Joker movie. How the hell do I do that? I think um, it's, it's, it's a cautionary tale, but not the way everyone's saying it is. This isn't a cautionary tale from the point of view of Arthur, and it is from Arthur's point of view, but the caution isn't about Arthur. It's about me and you. How many times have you got on a bus and laughed at some poor soul? How many times when you were at school and you were in a group did you bully people? How many times have you mocked someone on social media? You haven't done it before? Then you're lying. The cautionary tale of the Joker movie isn't about Arthur, isn't about the individual who's struggling. It's about us and the way we treat each other and the way we treat people. And as I keep on saying, how many times can you push an individual until they push back? But this individual and the, con and the consequences of pushing this individual are high. And that's what the cautionary tale is for this film. Now, we need to talk about Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Hey, damn it. Let's talk about Man of Steel as well. Imagine if those films, especially Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, actually had a black label could it have could batman v superman have been in a venice film festival no why because it's called batman v superman and there's so much snobbery within this industry it would never have got in but i believe that this film could have got the critical acclaim that todd phillips joker movie is getting right now but why didn't it didn't it? One of the major reasons Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was garbage within the critical community is because the studio lied about what it was. The studio tried to tell us and critical media that this was a mainstream movie about two epic, awesome superheroes fighting it out. But there was so much more beneath the surface because Zack Snyder, Chris Terrio and David S. Goya are making as bold a statement in Batman v Superman as Todd Phillips is making in the Joker movie. But that message is ignored by critics. Why? Why isn't Batman v Superman a critically acclaimed film? The right film at the wrong time. It's as simple as that. The divisive nature of the film is that people really, really believe they were getting something else. But instead, they got a movie set in our real world. Todd Phillips, I was watching an interview with him at, Ve at Venice, talking about this film and talking about putting Joker in the real world, which is exactly what Zack did with Batman and Superman. He put them in the real world. And what did he get for his troubles? A spit in the face. It was a spit in the face because nobody involved with the film was willing to say, hey, this is a dark piece of movie literature, right, that puts these characters in our world today. And if you, sh if you shove a DC black label on that movie, it is loved. Or maybe it's not. 
Maybe the true divisive nature is the mainstream's hatred of Snyder. This illogical hatred for the man. Maybe whatever the man touches will always be reviled. And that's a tragedy. He's one of those directors that nobody, well, no, we love him, of course, but I'm talking about the mainstream, that the mainstream take offence by because he dares to be different and he dares to be unique and he dares to make compelling content. But make no doubt that Batman v Superman is making similar statements to the Joker movie. But that was rejected by most people because, as I say, it's the right film at the wrong time. So what do you think about everything that's going on right now, um, about the Joker movie, about what I said, the comparisons I make with Joker movie and Batman v Superman, and just this brilliant critical response? There's always going to be a couple of SJWs who are not happy, but I'm not done here today because I've got some massive Flash Season 6 news in a moment. Yes, big, big news if you're fans of the Arrowverse franchise and the Flash TV show. I certainly should have. I certainly was in the first two seasons, but then I lost interest within season three and what they were doing. But big news if you are still a fan and wanted to set to appear in the Flash season six premiere. It has been confirmed that the other worldly character known as the Monitor will feature prominently in the Flash Season 6 premiere. After first debuting on the inaugural CW show Arrow, the Flash aka Barry Allen was quickly spun off for adventures of his own. The Flash later helped produce further spin-offs such as Legends of Tomorrow and the upcoming Batwoman show. As the most consistently rated of all the current Arrowverse spin-offs, the show has constantly run for five seasons, and season six is currently in production. The Flash season six looks to be an especially busy and harrowing time for Barry Allen and his team as seen at the end of Flash season five. The timeline had been so drastically altered that Barry's long prefaced disappearance was now set to occur at a much earlier point in time. With Crisis on Infinite Earths confirmed as the next crossover event and already teased in each Arrowverse season finale, season six will tackle that ill-fated destiny and its subsequent fallout head-on. Unlike um, previous crossovers that provided a merely a, div a diversion from the collective show's main thread, Crisis on Infinite Earths is so pivotal to season six that showrunner Eric Wallace has revealed that the season will be split up into two distinct storylines, pre-crisis and post-crisis. Very exciting. Speaking with Comic Book at San Diego Comic Con, Grant Gustin revealed that the build-up to the crossover will be felt straight out of the gate. Gustin, who plays the titular speedster, confirmed that the monitor, La Monica Garrett, pays Barry a visit in the season's opening episode with a dire revelation. The Monitor shows up at the end of our first episode and says the universe is in jeopardy. And in order to save the universe, Barry Allen has to die. He said, Gustin went on to refer to Oliver Queen, Stephen Amell, who, who to fulfil his end of a deal was last seen venturing into the unknown with the Monitor. Barry Allen doesn't know about this deal Oliver made with the Monitor either. So someone's going to die. Actually, this is Arrowverse. Nobody's going to die. Let me warn you about this now. Nobody's going to die. The impending crisis won't be the only issue facing the Flash and his allies. When the season opens, everybody will be still be grieving the death of Barry and Iris's daughter, Nora. But don't worry, they'll find a way to bring her back. After travelling back from the future to defeat, help defeat the infamous serial killer, Cicada, she ultimately played directly into Reverse Flash's crawl, Machination, what machinations? As a result, she was erased from existence right before her parents' eyes. And don't tell me, in crisis, she's brought back. Bet you any money, zero consequences. Storytelling, everyone. Recent set photos also confirm the return of the villainous speedster Godspeed. It's also been confirmed that the comic book villain Bloodwork will serve as a primary antagonist. Now, I'm quite interested in Bloodwork, blood work, actually. It is understandably Crisis on Infinite Earths, however, that has provoked the most excitement based on the seminal 1985 comic book storyline by uh, Marv Wolfman. The latest crossover is expected to be an end game level event for the Arrowverse with such a prominent guest stars as Burt Wood, 
and Kevin Conroy as Bruce Wayne already. Confirmed anticipation is sky high at the prospect of watching the various heroes unite to battle the multiverse destroying threat of the Anti-Monitor. Also, also Garrett. As such, the news that events will kick off even earlier than assumed will no doubt please fans immensely. Well, uh, look, I started watching Arrowverse. I watched Arrow for two seasons. I watched The Flash for two seasons. I watched DC's Legends of Tomorrow for a season or two. And then they did what they did. And I said, enough is enough. I'm a man. They don't like me. I have to stop watching this. Instead of getting angry and butthurt, I think that's what people should do. That's how you hit them. Hit them in the wallet. So you don't like what they're giving you, don't watch it anymore. But I am going to come back to Arrowverse because it's a big year. It's the final season of Arrow. We've got Crisis on Infinite Earths, and it does sound very exciting. But let me be clear, as I said while I was reading that article, there is no question about Oliver or Barry dying. That I can assure you of, because that's not how these people roll. This is mainstream TV, and things like that, like character consequences, just don't happen.